for inviting me. I'm encouraged to see here a number of young faces. Uh, so it's a, a really uh, communication uh, which is uh, speaks about uh, our uh, globalized world today. I'm speaking from Miami, but I was born in the Czech Republic. Uh, so I will be mixing up uh, two perspectives in my presentation. Uh, contemporary challenges of democracy, uh, trying to understand my own experience and put myself a little bit into your shoes and maybe to feel your questions uh, in this situation. Obviously, to start, it's uh, appropriate to thank the organizers, El Departamento de, de Estudios Internacionales uh, on the, uh, the, of the University and Center for the Study of Contemporary Open Societies, uh, that are um, uh, organizing uh, this event. Uh, I'm going to cover some ideas uh, from an article uh, that was published in Modelo a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, under the title Chinese Question in the Times of Coronavirus. So if uh, I am not able to articulate my thoughts here uh, with enough precision and clarity, uh, certainly you can check it uh, in my written uh, contribution uh, to this debate. Uh, I'm supposed to speak about contemporary challenges, but I will start from two texts that were uh, written a really long time ago, maybe more than 2000 years ago, as a, a point of departure. Uh, the first is a part of the speech of Pericles in his funeral oration made uh, in the end of the first year of the Peloponnesian War, which means uh, 439 before the current era. And the second will be uh, 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 the seventh letter of Plato uh, that was uh, written uh, later, but still reflecting on the Greek experience. So let me start from Pericles. In his speech, uh, he uh, says that about uh, the government in his city-state. Let me say that our system of government uh, doesn't copy in institutions of our neighbors. It is more the case of our being a model to others uh, than of our imitating anyone else. Our constitution is called a democracy because power is in the hands not of a minority, uh, but of the whole people. When it is a question of settling private disputes, everyone is equal before the law. When it is a question of putting one person before another in positions of public responsibility, what counts is not membership of a particular class, but the actual ability which uh, the man possesses. No one, so long as he or she, we should add, has it uh, in him or her to be of service to the state, is kept in political obscurity because of poverty. And just as our political life is free and open, so it is our day-to-day -day life in our relationships uh, with each other. So this was the big vision of Pericles, and now uh, the experience of Plato, uh, articulated in his letter, written in 360, before our current era, which means uh, a little later. And he uh, reminds uh, uh, there his own experience. When he was a young man, he wanted to be engaged in public affairs. But then uh, uh, what was happening was uh, the failure in the Peloponnesian War uh, and uh, uh, his experience with politics. Changes of regimes, the tyranny of the 30, uh, 403 uh, before our current era, and uh, then what happened when democracy was restored. In both cases, he felt that something wrong was going on, that these ideals of articulated by Pericles were not, um, uh, I would say, materialized in daily activities of the regimes. Certainly his shock was uh, his 
experience with what happened with this great teacher Socrates, uh, that was first uh, resisting the tyrannies of the 30, and then he was condemned to death by a democracy restore. So here is the uh, Plato's uh, conclusion. Finally, it became clear to me with regard to all existing communities that they were one and all misgoverned. For their laws have got into a state that is almost incurable, except by some extraordinary reform with good luck to support it. And I was forced to say, when praising true philosophy, that it is uh, by this that uh, uh, men are enabled to see what justice in public and private life really is. Therefore, I said, there will be no cessation of evils for the sons of men. Obviously, we need now to uh, add uh, daughters of uh, human beings either those who are pursuing a right and true philosophy receive certain power in the state, or those in power in the states, by some dispensation of providence, become true philosophers. Obviously, this is a challenging proposition that uh, used to be challenged uh, very often and by many. Uh, it can be a big question raised here, whether philosophers are those who are here to give us some advice in our current problems or current troubles. Was Plato right or wrong in a description of role of true philosophers in public domain in the area of political, especially in the form of government cherished and generally recognized as the best option we have in comparison with all other alternatives, is democracy. Uh, I hope that you had an opportunity to look at these texts in your uh, college education. Please uh, reread them again and think them through. Just to be fair and clear, uh, there is a question, are philosophers friends or enemies of democracy or open society? Certainly, there are those like uh, uh, Karl Popper, uh, just to mention one of the thinkers of the 20th century, who blame Plato as a uh, uh, person who started this uh, process in which philosophers wanted to put themselves into uh, the kind of category of uh, ideologues or uh, those who should control public and people and uh, to uh, not to um, uh, believe in their common sense and capability uh, for self-government. But I would rather say that uh, given uh, the current crisis we are involved in, uh, philosophers might be rather friends of democracy, and it might be a good idea uh, to listen uh, to them carefully what they wanted to say. Is the story of Socrates, Plato puts into the center of his reflection on politics, uh, the matter of a distance and that death, uh, that past, uh, or are we living again in a kind of Socratic moment that should not be missed, but used effectively, if we want to find the right way consistent with our spiritual traditions to deal with the political evils or maybe uh, political challenges to formulate in, into more, uh, in a more subtle and diplomatic words, we are uh, or we seem to be surrounded in our current situation. And if it is not true uh, that uh, really uh, philosophers among us uh, who are qualified at least to refresh our minds and hearts and to reanimate our individual and collective actions and deeds uh, so that we will be able to overcome the current fears and desperation. And now I can quote from Václav Havel, former Czech president, certainly he would be rather on the side of the friends of philosophers. This is uh, maybe our Czech tradition going back to 
President uh, Masaryk, uh, founder of Democracy Czechoslovakia, who was philosopher, Jan Patočka, who was one of the element, uh, uh, crucial elements in the creation of Charter 77 human rights movement in our country, in our confrontation with communist totalitarian regimes, and also Václav Havel, who pronounced 11 years ago uh, in the European Parliament uh, uh, this thing. Maybe uh, if we are able to go back to their ideas, uh, we might be able to build a better world and also to be more true to ourselves. In other words, to put into practice the values that we proclaim in general terms. So this is my question at the beginning, and now let me to go uh, to my article, uh, Chinese questions in the time of coronavirus. So uh, what is uh, uh, pandemics? Everybody believes that it is a crisis. It is a situation in which we really need to resolve uh, uh, certain issues uh, that we could not have imagined three months ago. But a crisis uh, is not just only a difficult situation, it's also the moment of truth. It is a moment where certain decisions are to be made. It's a moment where a certain experience is being made. And the question is whether we can fruitfully and uh, uh, to our own sake uh, use this experience. What Another concept I would like to turn into your attention is uh, uh, discontinuity in time. Uh, some sort of revolutionary moment we all feel uh, that our future will not uh, go back to the past uh, we knew it before, that, that it will be a new normal. Uh, some people would uh, go directly and say, it is a kind of revolutionary moment. I see it here in the United States. We need to use this moment to change everything. And I would like to remind you, uh, in this context, just to think about a conversation that was uh, led uh, between King Louis XVI of France in 1789, in the 9th of uh, July 14, after Bastille fell uh, down to the, uh, uh, those who made his up, uh, absurgence. And he was informed about that event by uh, Duc de la Rochefoucauld d'Ancourt. And uh, then the King, uh, according to the report, exclaimed, a certain revolt. It's, that's a revolt. And uh, the answer he was given was very short and telling. Non, sir, c'est une révolution. And uh, there is a difference between uh, a revolt and revolution. A revolution is a discontinuity of time. It's a moment when you get that your future, that your tomorrow, will be different from your yesterday, that it will be not a uh, return to normal, but a new normal. And we have to be able to think about that in a productive and meaningful way. Uh, certainly, uh, there are more potential revolutionary moments in this situation we are finding ourselves, not just a, a pandemic crisis. Uh, we can uh, brought into our attention, let's say, US agendas of today, racial issue, which is very hot, and so this type of movement we can observe here day after day here around uh, ourselves in uh, uh, this country. But there are certainly uh, many, many global agendas connected with that. It can uh, be uh, environmental issues, climate change. It can be the fact that we are living in a very new world uh, surrounded by cyberspace which is uh, certainly a very strange and new uh, phenomenon. Uh, so uh, how we can uh, deal with our uh, current situation? I think that the first of all, 
uh, here, and we have already some material uh, in front of us, last three months maybe, uh, to be able to evaluate realistically and in an unbiased manner the way how our democratic systems in the United States, in the European continent, which means European Union and its member states, obviously based on my origin, I am very much interested in the situation of the Czech Republic, in Uruguay, in your case, or in Latin America as a whole, how have they reacted to this COVID-19 uh, pandemics? Uh, what are the results of measures taken by our governments? What will be the medium and long-term social and political impacts of this practice uh, that we have had uh, to get used in the past months? How much are our deep-rooted habits and behavioral patterns going to be changed in this new brave world, in the brave new world? What we, can we imagine now emerging around us uh, after the pandemic speak is over? For instance, will we really see the total disappearance of handshakes in the future as one of our very deep and old uh, social habits? Obviously, uh, more political questions are connected with uh, the reality of uh, let's say, state of emergency uh, that all governments had to uh, imply and use in our current situation. So big question is for all of us, uh, uh, if we want to see the situation from within of our democracies, what are the constitutional uh, uh, rules uh, set for this game? Here in the United States, there is an exciting thing to see the president, the governors, the local authorities, to trying to find out the ways how the responsibilities and powers are uh, to be uh, distributed. Uh, how they can uh, proceed in a coordinated manner. Uh, and uh, larger question, should the decisions concerning measures to be implemented be made hierarchically from the top down in the way the armed forces are used to operate, or rather coordinated locally at the state and the national level based on intensive horizontal communications between them and relying on the spirit of cooperation uh, yeah, traditionally at home, as Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, the sharpest observer of US democracy in the 1830s, liked to say, in all sorts of intermediary bodies of civil society, such as churches and multitude of non-for-profit voluntary organization in the first place. We also need to certainly take into consideration the fact that what we are dealing with is a highly unprecedented uh, situation, both in the speed with which it has emerged and in its scale and impact. There are hardly any examples in the past to provide safe guidelines to political leaders who are finding themselves at the helms of the situation, having as their primary epistemic tool, rather than anything else, their own often very poor and biased judgment, their own past decisions, uh, certainly not perfect, to say at least, that are always calling for improvements, adjustments, or even radical corrections. Uh, observing all the processes that we are all now participating in, in, uh, is in my point, is as follows. And I uh, follow, uh, observe this case already when I was in the United Nations, when all these <coughs> climate change discussions were taking place. There's no escape here from certain triangle, science, economics, and politics. Uh, uh, and from the conflicts of interpretation and strategies discussed and being corrected daily between those who participate in these triangle communications. Uh, as I would argue, uh, certainly 
uh, science should have a, a first voice here. All these uh, experts in COVID-19 situation and epidemi uh, epidemics, but also economists have uh, their voice to say because obviously economic impact is tremendous. But um, uh, this need to be taken. Uh, 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 they need to be heard first. But the fact is that the decisive role. Uh, will be uh, played by the politics of pandemics, uh, by politicians uh, that are taking their decisions that they should uh, maybe first to constrain themselves, to limit themselves, not to follow their political interests, to uh, give the voice to the first two uh, tops of this triangle, but uh, they are driven uh, by the uh, logicality of their own situation. Uh, so, uh, if we now want to speak about the war against invisible enemy, uh, how we should proceed? And my uh, hypothesis, my answer is very simple. The most powerful weapon against COVID-19 is democracy and the very existence of a free and open society. The only source of legitimacy of democratic rule. Our common essential task is in this fight is not to allow ourselves to be fragmented uh, uh, by these epidemics and turn into a mass society of individuals full of fear and susceptible to all sorts of manipulations. Uh, what does it mean? It means certain that certain restrictions can be and are justifiable imposed on the rights and freedoms of citizens of democracies, but it also means that such restrictions are imposed on them only within the limits allowed in democratic societies. It means standing respect for separation of powers and the rule of law. It means proportionality and only temporary character of uh, such measures. And with all uh, respect to all of that, here is what I consider as a key element of proper civic response to COVID-19 epidemics. We all as citizens should follow and implement the rules and orders being given to us by authorities, but at the same time to stay vigilant and on guard, uh, to be ready to raise our voices, if necessary, in defense of our freedom, because the state of emergency no matter how reasonably its declaration is justified in a democratic society, always offers the temptation to political leaders to manipulate or even damage irreparably for the sake of their own power, the democratic form of government, thanks to which uh, they are now endowed with emergency powers, and even to destroy it and replace it with some sort of oligarchy or autocracy. There are multiple examples in the history of mankind, and especially in the 20th century, that can be used as a warning in this regard. And the second thing is uh, challenges uh, to our democracies seen from uh, uh, the global perspective. There's one more characteristic of coronavirus pandemics that hasn't been mentioned yet: is global character. Uh, what is uh, of primordial importance is the fact that the spread of this virus that started uh, early, uh, maybe late, earlier than in June and January in China and within which the weak whole uh, planet requires a proper international response if the war against this invisible enemy is to be won. The truth of the matter is clear and simple. Because of nature and still only very vaguely known mechanisms of behavior of this entity, the war cannot be waged only by the individual nation states in the territories under their jurisdiction. It requires a concerted action of all members of international society around the globe. So the question is, what are the conditions for uh, such a uh, concerted action? 
And I would say is, uh, and this is the word being used in uh, certain documents in the context of European uh, concept of human rights, European convention, is based on a certain like-mindedness, similarity of spirit. Uh, the Greek term homonoia here is uh, uh, offered uh, as an inspiration used in Bible and in all other cases. The fact that democracies have their own traditions in your country, in my country, everywhere else, but there should be certain like-mindedness uh, available. The implication of this requirement is evident. What is being tested now and will be necessarily affected by uh, coronavirus epidemics are all existing institutional forms of international coexistence, be it uh, cooperation or maybe competition of all those who operate on the global scene. What must be used as a point of departure when analyzing and evaluating possible international responses to COVID-19 uh, crisis is the existing system of international relations, its legal basis, its financing, and its established practice. When we want to look around uh, the scene, certainly we uh, can hear political realists speaking, let's say uh, in uh, Henry Kissinger's tradition, uh, to uh, try to understand the changing uh, situation influenced by that uh, from term of uh, uh, geopolitics. Who are going to be uh, the main players here in the world uh, that we are entering into? Traditional big three, the United States, China, and Russia? Or will there be any other new participants in the global concept of world powers? How large might their zones of influence be, both globally and on regional scale? How are all other smaller and less powerful states belonging to global community going to be impacted as their potential clients. But uh, there are other perspectives here as too. Uh, political philosophers and anthropologists can bring into this debate uh, still another perspective. Science and technology, without any doubt, the key instruments at our disposal in the today's war against this invisible enemy are products of the European modernization project uh, that started in the Enlightenment period and gradually transformed the whole world to the form in which we know it today. Thus, our main weapon in this fight is European rationality, the European concept of scientific reason. And there are many, many debates concerning the validity of scientific reason today, and if you want to give uh, me to give you an example, you know all these statistical games, uh, statistical information uh, can have to be taken in the context of larger debate that is taking place among those who are really looking at the status of modern science today and its methodologies. But at the same time, political philosophers uh, can uh, give us another information, another hint. Uh, we are living in 2020, so one should not omit the fundamental reality of the contemporary post-European world. The unescapable fact that uh, universalism of European civilization is a matter of past now, uh, that what, we, uh, what must be factored in, in the first place, is the rise of non-other non-European cultures and civilizations, Chinese, Indian, Japanese, Korean, Latin American uh, experiences, and uh, many others with their different ethos, habits, patterns of behavior. There is no doubt that these two different sets of arguments, the one praising the gift of European rationalism to the, co uh, to the contemporary post-European world, and the other, one introducing postmodern relativism and recognizing the transformative power of other civilizations besides uh, the Western spiritual legacy based on the Greek philosophy, Roman law and Judeo-Christian religion must be accommodated here. But how? With what results? And here is uh, the conclusion of uh, this first part of my speech. 
uh, I want to strongly argue that the arguments I have tried to elaborate uh, in uh, when looking at uh, insight of our democratic systems and their capabilities to maneuver within the triangle science, economics, politics, is valid also in international realm. There is no escape from the triangle science, economics, politics there too. It is democracy uh, that must be recognized as a crucial weapon against COVID-19, not only domestically, not only within the orbit of European Western civilization, but on a planetary scale. What has to be brought internationally to action if COVID-19 and other viruses that may come in the future uh, are potent enough to cause pandemics is democracy's unique capacity for self-reflection and self-transformation. It's a readiness to keep discussions between scientists, economists, and politicians going in an open, unbiased, and non-ideological manner. It's firm commitment to the rationality of arguments that must be again and again critically re-examined and tested against reality and in the light of experience. The preference of a reality of ex experience before ideological biases and power manipulations of any kind. And the last but not least, the readiness of all democratic politicians to undergo willingly a test of democratic elections and be replaced, uh, if they lose, by others with different policies. The war against the invisible enemy called COVID-19 is an urgent call for the action of the world community of democracies. I spoke about that with Manuel Albright a week ago, and I remember her and uh, then Polish Foreign Minister Boronislav Geremek in 9, 2000, I believe, 1999-2000, they started in Warsaw the project called Community of Democracies, now a little bit in a sleeping state, uh, the international coalition of all democratic countries based on this homonoia like-mindedness uh, to deal with the current issues in a uh, common and productive manner. Uh, so uh, the second part is my Chinese questions. There will be two of them, but uh, let's call it Chinese questions uh, total. Uh, what is the today's conflict between democracies and autocracies? First, uh, where does China uh, stand in it? Uh, when uh, one observes uh, the behavior of its government uh, in the past months, uh, after the pandemics uh, burst out, I think that two basic facts must be restated first. First of all, China is an ancient civilization with its very specific historical experience going back thousands of years with a long historical memory, highly developed culture and many, many significant achievements. All of that has to be taken into account into any effort to understand the actions of the current existing Chinese nation state, the type of actual social contract between the government and its people, and also how this state today, a global superpower, operates internationally. That's why it's absolutely necessary, in my view, to consult the real experts here, uh, sinologists who are familiar with Mandarin, with the language and other Semitic languages, Chinese history, Chinese culture, who have sufficient knowledge to penetrate into the Chinese collective soul and understand customs, regions, basic patterns of behavior of this great country. And the reason is clear. What we are experiencing now, often in the form of new Chinese nationalism and unprecedented Chinese assertiveness on a global scale, is a much larger and much uh, deeper phenomenon than just sheer extension beyond Europe's borders of certain Gnostic revolutionary uh, movements. Uh, I mean, uh, Marxism, uh, Leninism, as we know it uh, from our own territories. What can we see here in action 
provoked by originally European political ideas is simply a great Chinese reawakening whose consequences in the future history of humankind are still unknown and cannot be fully assessed and predicted. So this is fact number one. But fact number two is also very significant. It is the fact that on October 1st, 1948, on the Tiananmen Square in Beijing, the leader of Communist Party of China, Mao Zedong, announced the creation of People's Republic of China and its program of a socialist revolution. Uh, so uh, China, whether uh, the Chinese culture is uh, deep uh, as much as we can, is a communist state is an embodiment of, of current totalitarianism. And I'm now working on the new version of uh, my contribution to one uh, American encyclopedia. I'm author of the chapter on totalitarianism, authoritarianism. Uh, so Chinese uh, contribution uh, in that respect is very significant. So what we see here, we see here uh, Chinese history and the communist rule uh, in the uh, past uh, seven decades. And I think that there were at least three very important turns here in this history. First, Mao Zedong's great leap forward in the late 1950s, and so-called cultural revolution in the 1960s uh, and 1970s. I think that those uh, who are now demonstrating uh, all around the world, uh, unfortunately, uh, seem to almost get some inspiration from this type of cultural revolution. But then we have uh, Deng Xiaoping's open door policy uh, that introduced the necessary flexibility and the significant uh, elements of liberalization and market economy in the 1980s and 1990s uh, into so far very rigid uh, Chinese economic model. And now we have what we have now. The political and economic model coined by, and realized now in the beginning of the third decade of the 21st century by the today's Chinese supreme leader, Xi Jinping. Uh, in spite of all these differences, it's an important thing, uh, something remains the same. Uh, the reality of a totalitarian state. The ideology that the state, a Chinese state subscribes to seems to be maybe less ideological in terms uh, of its adherence to the doctrine of scientific socialism and much more pragmatic as far as its practical uses and implementation. Instead of being dogmatic and stable, emphasizing uh, the purity of its Marxist-Leninist creed, it is constantly developed and reinterpreted in the never-ending efforts of the uh, uh, party ideologues, now with uh, Xi Jinping at their head, so that it can serve its main purpose. To, to keep Chinese population obedient under the strict top-down control. Uh, what is one of the main messages of Chinese uh, uh, state ideology? It's an ambiguous denial of the Western liberal tradition and all its values and fundamental principles. Respect for unalienable and thus universal human rights, the rule of law, the separation of powers, the recognition of the importance of immediate bodies of civil society, the civic participation in political processes, and free competition of political parties. Uh, when we want to see uh, the Chinese uh, system in action, and I think it's almost like if we want to repeat the basic preservation of all past derotations of totalitarianism, that it is now being materialized in China. Uh, I have here seven trades here. Uh, I can just uh, uh, offer you to your attention. Power totally monopolized in the hands of top party leaders, with a dictator at the helm, and in the hands of all entrusted functionaries on the party ladder, who are in charge of and decide about practically everything. No freedom of expression, no freedom of religion, no respect for privacy and other fundamental human rights. Three, omnipresent state secret police using huge networks of confidence and informers 
to collect information ready to act against anyone who shows the slightest sign of disagreement with the current party line. Four, disappearances and long-term imprisonments of all dissenters and potential opponents. Five, concentration camps, strongly reminiscent of practices of Nazi Germany and the Stalin Soviet Union, uh, designated, uh, designated to re-educate re their inmates by brainwashing and hard labor. Six, omnipresent state propaganda, the system of state education, fully subordinated to the needs of state ideology, the strict censorship of all media, the total control of social networks, the restrictive measures imposed on all the use of internet. Seven, economy totally controlled by the state and its huge enterprises and banking sector. Uh, one needs to take into consideration uh, that this model uh, under Xi Jinping has been pretty pretty successful and uh, the uh, position of uh, People's Republic of China on international international scene speaks for itself. It seems to me uh, that COVID-19 crisis also not only uh, is uh, shedding light on us, on our democratic states, how we are operating and uh, whether uh, there is something wrong with the operation, but also on the uh, realities of Chinese state as well. As you know, all things started in China with all uh, questions around the uh, information strategies and so on to forth. Now we see the people's war against an invisible virus uh, declared by the Chinese uh, uh, government. So what can be observed in China today from our democratic perspective? We see the tendency of members of the Chinese party apparatus trying first to cover up everything that could be seen as damaging the shining picture of Chinese, uh, current Chinese realities that could be blamed on them for such an unforgivable failure. That's why those who had the responsibility and were in charge for all efforts in Wuhan decided to suppress inconvenient information and reprimand those who had discovered it by labeling them as socially and politically dangerous leakers. And only later when things got so bad that they could not uh, be kept anymore as one of the party's many secrets, the supreme leader ordered to conduct their war operation by uh, all the steps uh, taken in Wuhan and now maybe in Beijing. Uh, as any other state in the world, China perceives to be at, under attack by a dangerous virus, but all strategies to win this war must also be thoroughly examined from an ideological point of view. And only if qualified ideologues say that there is no harm done uh, by their implementation to the regime, they can be approved. In, order, in short, in order to be able to protect Chinese citizens, Chinese totalitarianism has to protect itself first, and this rule must always be obeyed. In short, it seems to me evident that the Chinese government has been using, as it's uh, used to do in the past seven decades, all the instruments uh, it has in its totalitarian toolbox. Uh, so here is my Chinese question. Uh, is there any chance uh, that the crisis itself, in the long run, uh, can make uh, Xi Jinping change his mind and decide to gradually leave Chinese totalitarianism behind and start dismantling the oppressive regime and replacing it uh, with some uh, form of Chinese democracy? I think that this question needs to be kept open we don't uh, want to be ideologically, I would say, stubborn, and maybe political realists would, uh, should step in and give us here uh, some hints how they would be uh, planning their future operations in the communication with this state. But uh, uh, I uh, would like to uh, be uh, rather skeptical in uh, this uh, respect, I doubt that the Chinese current leader is capable of even thinking about such a profound turn 
at least with regards to where things stand in this moment and his modus operandi, but it still remains to be seen because all possible answers in our uncertain and fragile world may be possible and have to be kept open. But let me uh, to raise my Chinese question again, what is the attitude of the Chinese people to their religion, culture, history, experience towards democracy? Is there anything like traces of Chinese democracy uh, on the horizon? Obviously, uh, I know what normalization regimes can do for you. I lived for 20 years, uh, first half of my life in a communist regime. Uh, that's uh, people exposed to totalitarian radiation uh, rather have a capacity to coordinate themselves with the situation than to do something about that. But we need to uh, remind ourselves of certain facts that there are some other realities here too. First of all, what about all these courageous individuals like Liu Xiaoba, Nobel Prize winner in 2010, ready to go against the current and even ready to sacrifice their lives because of their democratic convictions. Even today, I believe there are so many like-minded people prisoners of conscience in Chinese jails. And I can imagine there might be millions of people in China today dreaming about freedom and democracy in their homes. We should not forget about the members of Falun Gong sect, the members of Christian churches, also living in oppression for their religious beliefs. There is for sure an army of independent bloggers struggling for their free cyberspace. And there are also Chinese scientists, doctors, uh, and all others uh, who, uh, simply because of their profession, have to protect the principles of scientific rationality. And then uh, we can go on and on. What about inhabitants of the Chinese provinces of Tibet or Xinjiang, Buddhists and Muslims? And of course, what about students in Hong Kong demonstrating for democracy? What about Chinese in Singapore? I don't know much about that. What about the members of the Chinese diaspora around the world, here in the United States, in Australia, in Canada, in Europe, or elsewhere? How many people among them are Democrats, and how many are new nationalists? And uh, just to finalize this list, I, which is of the key importance, is uh, the Republic of China, Taiwan. Uh, this uh, small piece of China uh, that uh, was not uh, uh, taken over by communists in 1949. This country has undergone very successful democratic traditions. And especially in the times of coronavirus, it uh, demonstrated very well its capability to be a powerful and uh, effective uh, tool uh, or, uh, fighter in the war of uh, invisible enemy. The fact is that if there is a country that can be used as an example of uh, successful struggle in that respect, it is Taiwan. It is a state that can and could play, given its high level of scientific research and economic potential, an active role in the collective efforts of mankind to stop the virus in order to overcome all the consequences of his brutal attack. I'm convinced that the current international status of Taiwan is also important. I don't want to go directly against the policy of one China, but I believe that uh, the community of world democracies will be best advice uh, if it can look with fresh eyes in an attempt maybe to find some new creative solution in that respect. And let me uh, to uh, conclude with this. Going back uh, to my questions, Heracles uh, versus uh, Plato uh, dilemma. I think that we need both. Uh, we need uh, strong conviction that democracy is really the system uh, that uh, we should uh, put all uh, our uh, money on. But at the same time, we need to listen very carefully uh, to the critiques of democracy and to open-minded, moderate philosophers uh, who might have a, a 
uh, some areas uh, worth uh, to be taken into consideration. But obviously we are not living in the times of Greek ancient city-states like Athens uh, uh, in uh, the times of Pericles and Plato. We are in the middle of the crisis of post-European mankind in the second, uh, uh, in the end of the second decade of the 21st century. The reality we cannot escape from is simple. What we are not anymore, uh, we are not anymore just citizens of our nation states, signed into social contracts with our government and protected from the outside disturbances by the authority and the borders of our states. We may be Americans or, Anna or any other nationality first, enjoying our standards of living, cultural traditions, and being afraid about the future of our own now threatened and more and more insecure democracies. At the same time, however, and more importantly, we cannot omit the basic fact that we are human beings in the first place, living, uh, living beings endowed with reason, as the old classic, uh, classical political philosophers used to say. Belonging today to the emerging planetary mankind, and as such, we all have now our personal responsibility to resist the totalitarian threat, to keep our societies open, to preserve our democracies against their totalitarian enemies, to guard openness of our natural world that has acquired the planetary dimensions in our times. Because what is at stake today is the same what was always at stake in the whole history of mankind, to maintain in it that element of freedom, which still is the very essence of our humanity. Thank you.